So, Poreda, good morning. I'm Glenn Elwin. I'm speaking to you from Dartmouth campus. Um, I used to be in Cardiff, as many of you know, for many years, but I've been here for a couple of years now, reading a group on shared decision making. Dartmouth is a couple of hours away from Boston, um, on the border of New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, it's one of the Ivy League universities and home to about 5,000 students. But you may know Dartmouth because of the name of Jack Wemberg, who's famous from his work on the Atlas of Healthcare Variation. Um, and also Paul Batalden, who has worked on quality improvement and microsystems and actually led to the start of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston. Other colleagues I have are Elliot Fisher, Albert Mully, Gil Welsh, Steve Woloshin, Lisa Schwartz, for example. Um, these are some of the people who work in this area of trying to help share decisions with patients. Now, I'm doing a video because I wasn't able to travel to be with you this week, and so I've been given a few questions, and I'm going to try and answer those as best I can using this format. So the first question is, what is preference diagnosis? Well, clearly we all know the term diagnosis about getting the right answer to the right problem. That's clearly vital. But there's more to a good diagnosis than just that. There's also understanding what matters to people, what their views are, their priorities, what their preferences are. It's only when we know those things that we can fit the right treatment to people's lives and individual needs. So another question is why is it important to consider preference diagnosis as well as disease diagnosis? Well, the reason for this is that there are many alternative treatments. And if patients aren't aware of the benefits as well as the disadvantages of treatments, they can't really make good decisions. For example, um, many patients who become aware of the risks of major surgery make different decisions. They wait or even um, uh, decide not to have it altogether. Same in aggressive chemotherapy. They may decide that the trade-offs are not worth it for them. And many patients make different decisions again. A very good example is a situation where a woman has been diagnosed with early breast cancer. A woman in this situation immediately faces two surgical choices, having a lumpectomy with radiotherapy for six or eight weeks, or a mastectomy where the breast is cleared. Now, you might think, surely there's a correct answer here. But the reality is that the long-term survival in both these situations, both these surgeries, is exactly the same. So it's a reasonable choice to give to women. Now, the difference, a real relevant difference here, is the, the level of recurrence of breast cancer in these two situations. Let me introduce you to a tool that we're using to help explain uh, this to women, uh, called an option grid. It clearly shows that the uh, recurrence rate for lumpectomy is 10 in 100 for 10 years, and in mastectomy it's 5 in 100 for 10 years. Now clearly this is maybe seem like a small difference, but it's actually double the rate um, in lumpectomy. So women take notice of this when they become to understand it. You also might think that a woman in her late 60s who's living in a very remote area who has to travel for radiotherapy for six to eight weeks might make a different choice to a woman who's younger and who is keen on breast conservation. So you can immediately see, I think, that these personal situations make a difference to the treatment decided on. And that's why I think preference diagnosis is a really important skill for clinicians. So the next question is, how would preference diagnosis support prudent healthcare? I'm not very familiar with the term prudent healthcare, but it sounds to me as if it's about being careful with your resources and using them wisely. And I think shared decision making would help you in this way. We know that when patients become informed and involved, they often choose to wait or to have less aggressive treatments, often less expensive treatments. So in this way, um, preference diagnosis would help you conserve your resources. So what are the risks of not considering patients' preferences? Well, we know from the literature that there are over 100 trials showing that patients make different decisions when they become better informed. So the risk is that we give treatments to patients that they wouldn't otherwise have chosen to have if they'd been better informed. 
and that risk expands, exposing them to harms. Um, we know, for instance, that the harms of treatments run at about 5 to 10% of all procedures. And so why would we expose patients to these risks if they would have chosen different things, if they'd been better informed, and if we'd been aware of their preferences? So what's the scale of preference misdiagnosis? Well, I think it's massive. Um, we know that clinicians don't do this in routine practice. It's difficult. It takes time. Um, it's difficult, in fact, to find the information to share accurately with patients about the harms and benefits. It takes a skill and a lot of time to get the basics in front of patients so that they begin to understand and feel supported in making good decisions. So what needs to change so we can achieve preference diagnosis? Probably we're talking about a culture change in medicine, and I know that's a big ask. I've introduced a model called the three-step talk model, which is about team talk, option talk, and decision talk. In the team talk, we say to patients, we're facing a tough decision here, and we're going to do this together. We're going to work out what's best for you, and we're going to do that as a team. That's team talk. And then option talk, we say, here are the alternatives. Here's the good things about A and the bad things about A, and here's the good things about B and the bad things about B. How do you think about these now that you've understood these options? I want to hear your views, how they fit into your life. And then finally, decision talk. How do we put all this together so that it fits into your life? In essence, we need to become very curious about people's views when they've understood things well. And that curiosity, I think, is a fundamental part of good clinical practice. One way of doing this is to use option grids, tools that are very short, they allow patients and doctors to sit together to compare these alternatives one frequently asked question at a time. Um, we're running many studies to try and see how well these tools might help doctors do this. So, how do we shift the focus? How do we make this change? Well, I think it's not easy, that's for sure. Um, but we also know from a decade of work of looking at audio tapes is that clinicians are beginning to change. They're sharing much more information with patients. There's more evidence-based guidelines around and those conversations of information sharing are beginning to happen. But what's much more difficult is how to elicit people's preferences, their views and priorities, and now how to integrate those preferences into good decisions making going forward. We know that's much more difficult. Now we've been developing a short measure for patients to report on this um, called Collaborate. Um, it's got three items. Was there an effort made to inform them? Was there an effort made to elicit their preference? Was there an effort made to integrate those preferences into the next steps? This is a measure which we're using in the NHS in the UK and also in America here at Dartmouth. We're beginning to get some reasonable results. And I think by feeding back to clinicians whether they're doing a good job about these three different types of talk, we will be bring about, slowly but surely, a culture change in medicine. And I think that'll be good for patients. So the last question is, what's the role of decision aids in changing and creating these new conversations? Well, there's no doubt that decision aids are very important. They help patients understand the options, the information about the options much better. They help clinicians actually get up to speed about the evidence, so there's also benefit in that way. But by themselves, they're not enough. Changing the conversation needs the clinicians to become curious about people's preferences. And that's, I think, the key requirement here. Patients can help us. They're beginning to ask more questions. They're becoming more informed by the very nature of society, becoming more uh, aware of the need to ask questions. Um, and this, this combination, eventually, of a curious clinician and an informed patient that will lead to better clinical practice. That's, I think, is how we're going to get better at doing preference diagnosis.